Welcome to North Beach Oral History Project. Our subject today will be the Interpretive Center here in Ocean Shores. I have a wonderful co-host with me, Miss Ms. Ellen Lord. <laughs> oh, hello, Ernie. It's so glad, I'm glad to be here with you. And you know, the Interpretive Center is really near and dear to my heart. Several of us worked very hard there before it became a part of the city. In fact, uh, the Balmers and the Lords and Norm Scott uh, went together and talked with the city manager and convinced the city manager that we should be taken over by the city of Ocean Shores. And so it's been wonderful to see how this has developed and what a wonderful treasure this is for the citizens of our community. Well, I'll bet when you started this that you didn't realize that they would be getting into 18,000 people a year going through there and that oh, type of thing. no, but I'm so glad to see it. Yeah, isn't that fan <laughs> it's fantastic? Wonderful. And our guest today is absolutely wonderful. Philip Martin is a member of the Quanau Indian Nation. He spent over 30 years working with the Indian Nation in various capacities. He has a degree in fishing. He's been a river guide on the Quanau River. He has worked with forestry and fishing. He has worked with the Quinault Beach Resort. Uh, so many capacities in which he's contributed to the success of the Indian nation. Well, that's really uh, great that we have such a super guest as that to really let people know what it's all about. That's true. Go again, I guess. Um, uh, I'm here at Point Grenville on the Quinault Reservation. The ocean's behind me. We're standing on the first part of our clam beds. We have clam beds from up here to the, from the point to the Mokups River, and uh, they pr produced over the years many th thousands of pounds, tons of clams for our tribe. This is a very pristine area. You see no, I'm looking up at the trees and that's all I see is trees. I look south and all I see is clam beds. I look to the west and I look at those beautiful rocks behind me and there are just thousands of birds on those big rocks out there. And but we're, this, they've been here like this since I've been a young boy and I'm a little bit over 25 now. But uh, the things that are happening here with us on the ocean, we have had problems. Uh, in the 60s, we had a big oil spill just south of us, and uh, uh, thousands and thousands of clams from here to ocean shores were killed on the beach because of the oil. The Valdez had an impact up there, but this was our impact down here, and it lasted for many years the consequence we had to pay for the, the oil spill. But we do have a pristine area here and, and it's, it's so beautiful and we want to keep it that way. The things that are happening here have been to the good and the bad. Right now, I'm looking at a friend of mine I'd like to introduce to you, uh, Guy McMines. Guy has been a Councilman, he's been uh, he's graduated from the university and went on for working on his bachelor's degree. He's uh, been our representative on our tribe and the council. He's been uh, representing our tribe and our tribal all of the tribes in the state of Washington on the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. <clears throat> he's uh, been working with the international group of scientists on studying our ocean and uh, with that I'd like to introduce Guy McMines. Uh, I want to talk about two things about the ecology of this particular area. One to show you that we have some high food chain feeders out here and we have some middle of the food chain feeders that we survive on and some lower ones. Uh, the first incident I want to talk to you about is a personal experience I've had in this cove with killer whales and porpoises. Porpoises are the food 
four killer whales. Seals and porpoises and salmon are the food for killer whales. Uh, one particular evening I was down here and I saw porpoises in the bay. And I started looking around and I saw a pod of killer whales. And I started observing what they were doing. They were keeping the porpoises in the bay. It was at low tide. So they couldn't get in to get the, the uh, porpoises. And they were waiting for the tide to change. These critters are smart so they could get in there and get at the porpoises. Now, it got dark before I got to see a kill, but I knew that was going to happen. That gives you an idea of how rich our life is in this particular cove area. There's one other phenomena right near the mouth of the Quinault River called the Quinault Canyon, which is a huge canyon, but it has a lot of li little fingers or rivers of water that basically come from the northern ice cap and the southern ice cap as they migrate down around the, the Cape of Good Hope, I guess is what they call that, and they meet the southern ice cap water and come north, they come into this huge canyon and as they hit the small figure, fingerlets of the canyon, they bubble up, they speed up, and they spring up and they create a really rich environment that just uh, supplies the life for our fingerling salmon as they come down the river. Uh, they feed there. The next stop is the Juan de Fuca Canyon, and they go on up north, and they follow these canyon things where they can get rich with their prey, and they move on north. Wow, wasn't that very interesting. We really want to thank Philip Martin for his great uh, uh, program that he showed us today from this beautiful bay. Well, he always has great things to say, but we have another guest who also is absolutely fabulous, Jean Woodwick. Jean Woodwick is a historian and she is curator of the Ocean Shores Interpretive Center. She's worked with them for many years and she serves on several boards, one of which is the uh, Aberdeen Museum and the uh, State Museum and the um, uh, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. And she just has so many wonderful things to tell us. Yeah, and she's a very neat lady. Uh, if you want to know anything about the North Beach, talk to Jean. Right, you are. Jean, we're so glad to have you with us today. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the formation of the Ocean Shores Interpretive Center, which actually was begun by the Friends of the Library, and when this was still a part of the Ocean Shores Development Association. And they had a dream that culminated in having an actual scientific presentation at the center that was later during the planning season when NICS hit the area and devastated the economy, uh, they were able to convince the state to come in and develop something that would attract the tourists here. And from that, the state parks took it over and operated it until it, in the early 90s when uh, budgetary cuts caused the center to be closed. Then a group of volunteers came in and they taught children and they had some summer programming in there. But uh, it became a very, very big task and it burned out and so in 1997, a group of people, a committee, uh, sat together and thought about what could we do with this, and the city then entered into uh, the program of operating their own interpretive center. At that time, when I first came, it was just, um, you know, it had been used for a long, long time. And I loved the area, and I could see that the area had a great story to tell. It, its history is phenomenal, its geologic history is very, very unique, and it has such a long history of mankind between uh, five 
to 11,000 years just on the peninsula. And of course, I'm talking about the original peninsula, which only went as far as where Point Brown is today. It was a very narrow peninsula. It has had a fantastic history that we tried to show at the center. Um, <clears throat> this was an area of fur trading. It was one of the last areas where commercial uh, otter, sea otter hunting actually occurred. It is uh, at the end of the graveyard of ships. So in my own personal collection, I have probably 395 ships that's gone aground on the spit. So maritime history is very interesting uh, to it. Uh, it also had a lot to do with manufacturing, having the iron, pig iron uh, plant. And then, of course, Menards running cattle here. Cattle had been a long, long time. Uh, they were originally brought here by the Presbyterian Church for the Indian nation. And uh, this was also, you know, so much of transportation, it's all tied in, and then tourism. So I was so fortunate because I had a board that really believed that these things would be possible. And uh, I came up with some pretty wild ideas at times, but they kind of work out. Then uh, an association was developed, it's the Ocean Shores and Turkish Association, and they are the support group, and they also um, take care of volunteers, which the center could not operate without, and Diane Beers became the Interpretive Center's volunteer coordinator. Thank you, Jean. That was very interesting. We'll turn it over to Helen. Well, Jean always has wonderful things to tell us. She's far too modest about her role at the Interpretive Center. You know, we were so fortunate to have her as our director and curator, and she has brought that place so far. They've had one building program, they're approaching another building program, and just expanding. There's so much interesting, and Jean just brings so much to the Interpretive Center. We're really grateful for her. Oh yeah, she's a wonderful lady. She's probably got more history of than anybody <laughs> other than Helen uh, here yeah. of Ocean Shores. But we have another great person with us this afternoon, also from the Interpretive Center, Diane Beers. And she's fondly known as the Bone Lady. She's had an interest in skulls and bones since she was in high school. She's always lived on the beach and, and she just has so much to offer as our docent, our head docent at the Interpretive Center. Um, she, just, she just brings a great deal to the center and so we're lucky to have her with us and we're glad to welcome him, Diane Beers. Hello, I'm Diane Beers. I'm the docent at the Ocean Shores Interpretive Center. Uh, I'm just grateful and just admired to be there. I met Jean Woodweck in 1998 when we first moved down here, and I volunteered for three years, and she couldn't get rid of me, so she hired me, and I've been there ever since. It's a dream job come true. Uh, she has taught me so many things, and I've learned so much on history, and um, we built exhibits together, and it's just uh, wonderful to work there. We've had so many people come in, so many questions. I've learned a lot from the people, let alone uh, what we teach them. Uh, I've done the bone collections. Uh, that was one of my hobbies. And uh, it's just, uh, I can't say enough about the Interpretive Center. It has grown so much. Uh, we have one edition already, and we're working on another one. We had over 18,000 people in there last year. Uh, and it's just fun to go to work. Uh, I enjoy every day of it. Thank you, Diane. Uh, great lady to watch. And uh, now you know who the bone lady is. Helen. Uh, so now they can stop down at the Interpretive Center and look up Diane. Yep. Our next guest was with us last time. He is Alan Raymer, who is an incredible educator in the field of marine ecosystems, and he has some interesting things to say about the Interpretive Center. Alan Raymer. Hi, my name is Alan Raymer. I'm with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm a marine educator 
and I would like to tell you why I think you need to visit the Ocean Shores Interpretive Center. I was involved with the Ocean Shores Interpretive Center early on in helping to develop the Marine Room, and this facility I think is a marvelous, marvelous um, um, resource for people living in the community and visitors too. I think there's something to be had at all seasons. Um, it's open by appointment only during the winter time, and it's open 11 to 4 during the summer months. And this facility has something to do for everyone in the family from the time you leave your car in the parking lot. When you walk up on the porch, there are observation towers for wildlife and birds. They also have um, books there so you can record uh, your observations that you find. And when you walk into the door, you're going to be greeted by the friendly staff. It has hands-on activities and things to be held by the children from the time they get into the door. There are many different resources for educators, so if you're a teacher or educator from another area, you'll find many um, resources here to be used away from the area. When you come into the doors, um, there's going to be many different rooms that you can explore. And one of the rooms involves um, marine animals and terrestrial animals. These are probably only the few things that you can't touch in the area are the bigger animals, the bigger mounted animals. The, um, one of the rooms is really uh, popular, has the history of this area. And this area has a very, very rich and diverse history, both in logging, fishing, clamming, nautical history. So um, I think it's an a place for you to reconnect uh, to the community. And also by learning about these areas, it's a chance to reconnect to your areas and the rich history that you may have in your area. This, um, besides the history of the human impact on this area and the, marine, uh, the wildlife, there are also rooms on plants and animals. They have um, a big, uh, big display on different types of gems and minerals that you'll see in this area. There are lots of pictures and displays on different types of plants. So if you're a plant lover, you're going to love the plant and geology room. Um, one of my favorite rooms is the uh, main hallway. And the hallway has a big display on beachcomber. I'm an avid beachcomber, and so you're going to enjoy looking to see the different types of things you can find on the beach here that come from many different areas around the world. The um, marine life room is also a very interesting place to go and learn about clamming and crabbing and fishing. And there's, um, throughout the um, building, you're going to see different types of literature racks. So there's going to be a lot of literature and booklets that you can pick up on all these different rooms. It's really a marvelous place to come and explore, whether it's sunny or it's rainy, and you need to allow a lot of time and bring the whole family. Ernie, this has been a joy to have so many wonderful guests on our program and so many things we have learned from them. And we're going to look forward to seeing them out in the community, continuing all the wonderful things they do. Yeah, there's uh, some great people that we had on this series, and uh, they're just uh, fascinating. They are. Again, they're, the stories are very interesting. And uh, this concludes uh, the oral, oral history of Ocean Shores for this segment. And we thank you for looking and listening and we'll get better. <laughs> Thank you.